And if I get distracted listening to the love of my life, how much more do we get distracted when God is trying to speak to us? And let's be honest, we live in a very distracting world. A very noisy world, full of distractions. There are four different men named Philip mentioned in the Bible. Philip was the name of two of King Herod's, the great sons. He had, Herod the Great had two wives and through each wife, he had a son, and he named both of them Philip. They were not a good Philip in the Bible. A third Philip in the Bible was known as a servant of Christ, an instrumental in the early church. Philip would become a disciple and eventually one of the 12 apostles. Jesus called this Philip, who had been a disciple of John the Baptist's, and then Philip went and found Nathanael and told him about Jesus. Nathanael would also become a disciple and an apostle. The Bible does not contain much biographical detail about this Philip, but tradition says that he would uh, become a missionary in Phrygia, which is modern-day Turkey, as a missionary and would eventually be martyred in Hierapolis. But today we're not talking about either of those three Philips. We're talking about the fourth and the last Philip mentioned in the Bible. Now, this Philip had a couple of different nicknames. They were all good nicknames. Maybe you have weird or quirky nicknames. I know I have a few. Some people know what they are. And I'll just leave it at some people. I'm going to give this Philip one more nickname. So let me introduce to you today to who I call Philip the faithful. And we're in Acts chapter 21. And in, if you could look with me now in verse number one. In Acts chapter 21, in verse one, it says, And it came to pass after they, after we were gotten from them, this is the apostle Luke, he's writing on his first hand account, we were gotten from them and had launched and came with a straight course unto Cus and to the day following unto Rhodes, and from thence unto Patara, and finding a ship sailing over unto Phoenicia, we went aboard and set forth. Now when we had discovered Cyprus, we left it on the left hand and sailed into Syria, and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unlaid her burden." And finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. And when we had accomplished those days, we departed and went our way, and they all brought us on our way with wives and children, till we were out of the city, and we knelt down on the shore and prayed. And when we had taken our leave one of another, we took ship, and they returned home again. And when they had finished our course, when we had finished our course from Tyre, we came to Ptolemaeus and saluted the brethren and abode with them one day. Here it is. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea. And we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist which was one of the seven, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. Now, if you were just to read this passage in itself, it wouldn't be that special. A lot of names and places and traveling around, and it's easy to kind of get lost and to sort of zone out, really, if you're reading. But there's something very significant about Paul and his company meeting up with Philip, who is called in this passage the evangelist. And we'll talk about that term in just a second, maybe a few minutes. Paul now, coming to Caesarea and meeting Philip was significant because the last time Paul had seen Philip 
was all the way back in Acts chapter 8, verse 40. And we'll turn there in just a little bit. Back in Acts 8, 40, we see Philip was preaching and he makes his way over to Caesarea. And that's the last time we hear of him back in Acts chapter 8. 20, and some would even say close to 30 years later, Philip is still in the same city, preaching the same gospel, loving the same Savior. Philip, for 20 to 30 years, stayed faithful to God. And not just stayed faithful. What makes this chapter even more interesting is in verse 9, uh, Acts 21, verse 9, now he had help. It says, and the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. This is interesting. Philip now, for, the, for 20 plus years, has stayed faithful to God, and now his family is serving him in ministry. Also interesting, it points out that they were virgins. It could mean that some of them were, really, were younger or older, but if they were younger, generally the Bible would call them children. I think the fact that they're called virgins here signifies that they were of the age of marriage, but they had chosen to stay with their dad and to follow God. And maybe they weren't opposed to marriage, but it hadn't opened the door to them, and they were content and the Bible even says here they were prophesying. Back when prophecies were still there, these ladies were there with their dad preaching and prophesying the gospel of Christ. Philip the faithful. If I have three points tonight, this would be this morning. This would be, I say tonight because I usually preach at night. Philip the faithful would be point number one. Now, isn't this the goal for every family? I hope, every Christian family to, say, 20, 30 years from now, to still be serving God alongside my family. I mean, isn't that the goal? I, I hope that's a prayer of yours. I hope in the mornings when you're praying, you're saying, Lord, 20, 30 years from now, could I still be serving you faithfully? And especially if you're younger here and you have younger children, is this not the goal? To say, Lord, 20, 30 years from now, could I and my wife and my children be serving you together? I hope that's a prayer of yours. I hope that's a goal of yours, because it's certainly a goal of mine. Now let me add one more thing to this. It's hard enough to keep yourself faithful for 20, 30 years, much less keeping your entire family faithful and serving God. Not that it's the responsibility of the Father to keep them faithful, but he certainly plays a major, major role in their faithfulness to God, as we'll get into in just a little bit. Philip, for all these years, managed to stay in the same city, which is interesting because it's called an evangelist. Generally, at least in our modern terms, evangelist is somebody that would travel around from place to place preaching the gospel. But this idea, this term evangelist, simply just means a preacher of the gospel. It doesn't necessarily mean they have to stay in one place, though it would seem that Philip would tour around Caesarea and preach the gospel. How did Philip stay so faithful to God for all these years? How have you stayed faithful to God all these years, for those of you that have? Many of us here have grandparents who have stayed faithful to God all these years. Some maybe found God later in their life, but the question is still the same. How do we stay faithful to God? In order to answer this question further, I'd like to go backwards in time in Philip's life. And to go back, we're going to see that Philip, here in Acts 21, he, before he was called, before I call him, faithful, before he even became known as a faithful man of God that could, that could stay faithful for 20 plus years, he went by another nickname called Philip the Evangelist. So before he was Philip the Faithful, he was known as Philip the Evangelist. So let's go back now to Acts chapter 8, if we can. Let's see how this, this title came to play. 
Acts chapter 8, this entire chapter is almost dedicated to Philip. A lot of his teachings and preachings here. So Philip the faithful, now we see Philip the evangelist. And we see right off the bat, we're in uh, Acts chapter 8, and look at verse 1. It says, and Saul was consenting unto his death. He's talking about Stephen's death, who died, who was martyred in the chapter previous. And at that time, there was a great, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So the apostles stayed put. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. So it was a dark time in church history here. It was a bright time, but a dark time as well. The gospel was still young. It was being preached now, but persecution was forcing people to spread all throughout the known world. Now our guy Philip comes in. Verse 4. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria. Here's our guy right here, Philip. City of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one, with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake. In other words, they listened, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. So Philip was performing miracles as well. Verse 7, for unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them. And many taken with palsies and were lame and were healed. And there was great joy in that city. So Philip here is being known now as Philip the evangelist. And might I add, do you know where Philip went to preach first? Where's the first city he went to? He went where? He went to Samaria. Jews didn't generally like Samari Samaritans. We know this. But we know one person that preached in Samaria before Philip. Who was that? We know Jesus Christ did, and if Jesus cares for those people, then we ought to as well. And Philip, following the example of Jesus, went straight to Samaria and began preaching the gospel. He not only preached the gospel in Samaria, there's another unwanted area he preached to. If you look later down in the chapter, in verse 26, we see Philip preaching the gospel to an Ethiopian. It specifically calls him an Ethiopian eunuch, a man of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in verse 27. This was a prominent guy. And he went over and preached the gospel to him, a Gentile. This is somebody, especially this early in Acts, uh, the Gentiles weren't really preached to very much. The Jews still had a bit of animosity against them. They were pretty much focused on themselves, but not Philip. He grabbed the gospel, and he went right to the people who, were, who would listen and the people who weren't getting it in the first place. Philip the evangelist, he preached the gospel. You know, I think one reason why his daughters grew up serving the Lord is because they had someone to follow as an example. They had someone in their home that was an example to them to following God. They got to see their dad faithfully give his life to God every day. It wasn't just a, a one-time-a-week thing where he'd take his family to church and just kind of hope that they caught on. But Philip, day in and day out, was preaching the gospel. It was his life. It was his love. It was his passion. Otherwise, why would he have done that for 20, 30 years? It wasn't like he was paid staff like Christians today. Like even myself, Philip didn't get paid for this. He probably had some churches and maybe they would give a little bit here and there, but there was much better ways of making money back then. Not to mention, he, the, the persecution was still very much prevalent during this time. Philip, in order to do this for 20 plus years, had to have been dedicated to this cause. 
And it was that dedication, no doubt, that led his family to follow in his footsteps. It's, it's common for kids raised up in a pastor's home or a missionary's home to serve God full time. In fact, it's almost expected of them by some people. But it's an amazing story, and it doesn't happen as often, but when somebody grows up in a family that had nothing to do with God, and they got saved on their own, and they became pastors and missionaries, and believe me, there's lots of those stories as well. But just take your life, for example, or mine. When I was a kid, I loved baseball, I loved basketball, and I loved football. I didn't like soccer, and I'm sorry to offend some, I didn't like hockey, but I did like golf. Now, why was I picky about some and others? Well, those are the same sports my dad loved. I was just by default. I just did what I saw. My dad loved baseball. I played it a lot. He loved basketball and football. We played golf sometimes when there was a chance. Golf was something we played as a family. And uh, as from my aunts and uncles, and I grew up, I grew up liking the things that I, I that I was surrounded by. And in your home. What are you surrounding your home with? Because what you surround your home with is what they're going to end up doing, most likely. Now, not in every case is if your dad's a carpenter, will their son be a carpenter? But there's a higher chance of it happening than if it wasn't the other way, if it's the other way around. Why not give our kids the best chance possible to serve God and serve God ourselves and be the example that we need to be? We can't expect our children, we can't expect those in our, our household to serve God if we're not willing to do it ourselves. We have to take the time. We have to make the effort and show to our friends as well and our family that God is important to us, which of course is one reason why you're here today, one reason why we bring our families to church Sunday nights and even Wednesday nights when possible and Saturdays. We recognize that one of the most important things we could do as a Christian is to, is to share the gospel. And by the way, preaching the gospel is not just something for a pastor to do behind the pulpit. Preaching the gospel is actually something that every Christian is commanded to do. Because the word preach simply means to announce. And what are they announcing? The good news. What is the good news? the gospel. Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. The Bible actually says that all Christians are commanded to give, to announce the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not just for us, not just for men, but for all. When was the last time you preached the gospel to somebody? Has it been a while? Have you ever? We can at the very least, invite people to church. Our 25th anniversary is coming up. If you're a teenager, we've got our youth conference coming up. Big events are, are easy ways to, uh, to try to bring visitors in, especially those who need Christ. But when was the last time that you shared the gospel with somebody or even tried? Oftentimes, we see somebody, we just assume, oh, they're not interested. I know that because I think that all the time. I see somebody, oh, yeah, they're, they're too busy. They're not going to. Listen to me, and I've already told myself that they don't want to hear. Who am I to say that they don't want to hear the gospel? Let us be an example to those around us and to those in our family. Just as Philip was, he preached the gospel. Oh, but get this. Not only did Philip preach the gospel, look at verse 26. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. So I'm kind of skipping. I'm not going to go through the whole chapter. It would take a while. In verses 9 through 25, he actually preaches the gospel to Simon the sorcerer. And you could read that story. It's kind of interesting what takes place there. But after he's done preaching in Caesarea here, or uh, he's not in Caesarea now, he's in Samaria. In verse 26, now, by the way, people are getting saved. They're getting baptized. Great things are happening in Samaria. Philip could have just stayed there, but verse 26, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. 
All these great things are happening, and then God speaks to Philip. So as an evangelist, Philip preached the gospel, but he also listened to the Lord. He listened to God. Now this is important, because for many of us, listening is a skill that needs to be learned. All right? If you have children, or you had children, you know they don't always listen, right? Or it's selective Right? They, they, they listen to certain things. If you say the word candy, whoo, donut, ah, toys, boom. But it, for some reason, like clean room, they don't hear that. Like it's, it's like, it's just incredible. It's like this superpower. They can block out certain things. Oh, believe me, they hear it. They just choose not to. Brush teeth. Why, why is it so bad to smell? I don't understand. Why do you smell good? I don't get it. Go to bed. They definitely don't want to hear that one. I assure you. I assure you. We have listening. Now, men get made fun of too for not listening to their wives, right? Now, to be fair, all right, to be fair, if I'm, men also aren't known for multitasking, right? So ladies, just, just listen for a second, okay? If we're, uh, if, if we're doing something, right, if we're watching a basketball game, this is just personal examples here. If we're watching a basketball game and you're, and you're speaking to us, and if we're not looking at you, I, we're probably not listening, okay? Like, it's not that we don't love you. We love you very much. It's just you have to, you have to get our attention because I can't, you know, yeah, uh, yeah, oh, uh, yeah, you know what I'm saying? If your kids are tugging on your, on your sleeve, you know, and you're trying to, Daddy, they look at this, uh-huh, yeah, oh, man, wow, that's great. You don't have any idea what your kids are just showing you. This happens often for watching a movie or something. In order for me to really listen, I have to pause or turn away or look directly and give her my undivided attention. Otherwise, I'm not going to remember. I'm going to get distracted and I'm not going to fully comprehend what's about to be said. And if I get distracted listening to the love of my life, how much more do we get distracted when God is trying to speak to us? And let's be honest, we live in a very distracting world. A very noisy world, full of distractions. I mean, there's the obvious ones. There's the, the phone, there's computers, there's music, there's just our own thoughts that are always just bombarding us. Those are the, the common distractions I think most of us are aware of, but there's so many other distractions in life. The news, it's usually negative. All the perils that's going on in our world today. And by the way, there was a time when, when most of us would just watch local news, right? The local news, what's happening in my area right now? I don't know that our bodies, our mental health, whatever you want to call it, is just meant to just know all of the issues that goes on in our world today. It's depressing. All the wars and the violence and the crime. And it's one thing to just kind of focus on the area around you to make sure your children are safe. But man, we, we because of the news and the worldwide news now, we are bombarded with everything, every problem that goes on. And the news hardly ever says, hey, something happy happened today. No, it's always depressing, depressing, depressing. And we get bombarded with these distractions, health issues, anxiety, depression, financial struggles, relationships, and so on. So many things distract us from life. And we have to learn at times to stop and just listen to God. But it, it's hard when there's so many distractions. Did you know that King David struggled with this very thing, keeping his focus on God? Now keep your finger here, but look at Psalms 143 really quick. This is one of my all-time favorite chapters in the Bible. I reference it just about every morning in my prayer time with the Lord. Look at Psalms 143. Psalm 143, one of the last chapters there of Psalm. And this is a prayer here. So David is, is praying. He's asking God to hear him. There's something on his heart. He is burdened. His enemies are surrounding him. And 
I want to read this whole chapter, but let's just look at one verse, verse 8. David makes a great statement here in verse 8. He says, in fact, let's read verse 8 together. Cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning, for in thee do I trust. Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk, for I lift up my soul unto thee. David says, cause me to hear you. David was having trouble hearing God, or he wanted to make sure that he could hear God. In a world, he was distracted by all of the negative things happening in his life, and it's okay to say, Lord, help me hear you, because I got a lot of stuff going on in my life. And if you're normal, then you have a lot of stuff going on in your life. And if you don't have a lot of stuff going on in your life, hold on to this moment as long as you can. Because it's coming. King David, he's king. I would say he had a lot of stuff going on. And if King David struggled with this, we struggle with this. Faithful Christians need to learn to stop and listen to God. Get into a place, and by the way, the best place to do this is called the prayer closet. And I know sometimes when I get down to pray, I, my mind starts wandering. When, when I start to clear my mind, and I start to just focus on the scriptures and the Lord, I get a lot of stuff flying through my head. And something I've learned to do, I use my phone now, but actually phone's not even the best thing. Get a notepad or something. And when that thought comes in your head, oh, I don't want to forget about that. Just write it down real quick and then forget about it. And sometimes in my prayer closet, I remember some things that I needed to remember. God brings things to my memory I need but learn to listen to God. So Philip the evangelist, he preached the gospel. He listened to the Lord. Now keep your finger in Psalm 143 because we're going to come right back here. There's another good verse I want to show you. But uh, uh, go back to Acts chapter 8 real quick. And in verse 26, he listened to God. But what's the point of listening? Verse 27, if you don't do it. So after the angel told him, hey, I know good things are happening right now, but I need you to, there's one guy that needs your help. An Ethiopian guy, and I need you to go there. So verse 27 says, and he arose and went. He arose and he went. This sounds elementary, but a lot of people listen to God and they hear God but they don't act on that. They don't do anything with it. Oh, excuse me. Just trying to wake you up. In James chapter 1, verse 22, what does the Bible say? But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. I told you to keep your finger. Look back in Psalm 143 real quick. And look at verse 10. Psalm 143 and verse 10, this is the same chapter. He says in verse 10, Teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of our brightness. So he's saying, God, teach me to, to do what you've asked me to do. And it's okay to ask God, Lord, please help me to listen to you. Oh, and God, while I'm at it, help me to do what you want me to do. Help me to, 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 to go where you need me to go. It's okay to ask God for help. We always ask our children. It's okay to ask for help. If you need help with this or that, ask us. And God is the same way. So we have Philip the faithful. How did he become faithful? Well, he started out as Philip the... He, he was before the faithful. He was Philip the evangelist. But even before that, lastly... He was known as something else. Look at Acts chapter 6 real quick. This is the first time we see Philip. This is where it all begins. This is why God used him in the first place. This tremendous man of God. He went from Philip the faithful, Philip the evangelist, but before he had any of those things, he was known as something else. And in Acts chapter 6, Verse 1. It says, and, it, and in those days, 
when the number of the disciples was multiplied, and there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest reports, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Okay, so what's happening? By the way, the church in Jerusalem has grown exponentially. It went from a handful to, do you remember Pentecost? How many people were saved and baptized at Pentecost? Do you know the number? It was over 3,000, right? Then a couple of chapters later, Peter preaches again. Several thousand more come to Christ. This church is huge. Overnight, they're overwhelmed. And in doing so, a lot of the widows and a lot of the poor were being neglected. And the apostles said, man, we, don't, we can't possibly minister to all these people. We need help. Our main job is to preach and to pray and to minister to the people the gospel. We need people that can help in these ministries. So in verse 2, he brings the multitude of the disciples together. Some think this could have been the 120 that were called out of Jesus to, when they went out two by two. We don't know exactly how many people there were, but of all of the disciples that were there, they unanimously chose seven men, which means it was pretty easy. These men were honest, of good report, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. There was no doubt that these men were ready for the job at hand. And guess who they chose? You'll never guess. Never guess. Verse 5, and the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and what's that guy's name? Even if you weren't reading the Bible right now, you could still guess, right? Philip. He was the second guy chosen. This same Philip. He was known by all as somebody who was honest and someone full of the Holy Ghost. Before he was Philip the Faithful and Philip the Evangelist, he was known as Philip the Servant. Philip the Servant. Because it says here in verse 5, uh, excuse me, it says here uh, the verse, in verse 2, the multitude called them together, disciples, and said, it's not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. This service that these men were willing to do, that they would do. It says in verse 6, they set before the apostles and they, they prayed and laid their hands on them. And even then now was the church beginning to multiply even more. This expression, serving tables, means to care and provide for the daily needs of the widows and the families, those who didn't have as much. People have needs, and these men's jobs were to minister to them. I find this interesting. These seven men were chosen, and they're often called the first deacons, by the way. And the word deacon means servant. These seven men were chosen. They were honest, and they were full of the Holy Ghost, and their job wasn't to pastor a church. <laughs> it wasn't to be an evangelist. They weren't looking for prophets. They were looking for honest men full of the Holy Ghost who could serve tables, who could clean, who could talk to people, who could visit the widows. It almost seems like these men were overqualified. But it makes me wonder what kind of spirit-filled nursery workers we have today, or choir members, spirit-filled Ushers, deacons, spirit-filled sound booth workers, pastors, teachers. This spirit-filled idea we're going to look at more uh, actually next week. But I want you to understand this. God is looking for some honest, spirit-filled people. And sometimes we think, my ministry is insignificant in church, so 
I don't really need to apply too much to it. I can kind of just waltz in on Sunday and, and God will still use me. But if these apostles wanted spiritful men to look after to, to their visitations, so much more so us today. I wonder if we would have been chosen. If our church took a poll, we needed seven people who were honest, hardworking, and who loved God, full of the Holy Ghost. Would your name even come up on the list? Would you even be one of the top 20 or 50? You know, it's amazing. Many Christians are more concerned about what their boss thinks of them than what the King of Kings and Lord of Lords thinks of them. But Philip, he cared about what God thought. Philip, before he ever became an evangelist, before he became a fervent preacher of the gospel and became faithful for 20 plus years and helped lead his family to be the same before any of that, he was just an honest guy who loved God with all his heart. Didn't, it didn't mention any other amazing qualities about him because qualities don't matter. Talents don't matter to God. I don't have a good singing voice. I'm not talented. I'm scared in front of people. I'm this, I'm that. God could care less about any of that stuff. But do you love him? Do you want to serve him? That's all it needs. God can use that. Someone that is faithful to God and, and is filled with the Spirit, this is who God can use. You know, it reminds me of a story. But a pastor from the state of Michigan, in America, and back in the late 80s, God had called this pastor to plant a church on the west coast of America. Now, this pastor was criticized. Oh, we, we, need, we need churches here in Michigan. Why would you go out west? Out west, that's where the crazy people live. And I, I'm from the out west. Out west. You know, we're, we're west of Canada, but west America is different. They are kind of crazy out there. Well, this pastor didn't listen, and he, he followed God. And he went out in the late 80s, and he planted a church out at the, the west coast of America. The church, of course, was tiny. It was small at first, but it began to grow. Eventually, they got to a point where they purchased their own little property. And it was pretty amazing. Eventually, this church would start an RU program, which is like a program that reaches the drugs and the alcoholics, the addicted. And it began, it continued to grow. Things seemed to be going quite well. And one particular year, a, another like-minded church, an independent Baptist church, was started one mile from this church. I mean, you could almost see it, apparently. It was so close. And they began to talk to members of this church. And before you know it, after a year or two, this church that was planted by this pastor from Michigan had a huge split. Many of the core members left, and you could probably guess where they ended up going. But the church kept going. It, kept, it, it healed, and it kept growing. It never quite was the same, but eventually God called this pastor somewhere else to a different state. And before he left, he uh, had several candidates of the church co uh, come to the church, and the church voted on one particular man and his family. Well, less than a year later, this man and his family was not who they said they were. He would, they were immediately voted out of the church, and once again, the church split. Devastated by all this heartache now taking place, the church was even smaller than it was before. And at this time now, there was a void to be filled, and a younger, uh, less experienced man took over the church, and the church split a third time. Now you, this pastor who is no longer on the West Coast, he was out east, looking now, and by the way, this small church, it still exists today, but it's just, it's just barely hanging on. It's nothing what it was, what it could have been. And you know, this pastor in Michigan could look at all those years that he poured into this little church and he could easily say it was a waste. I mean, this pastor stayed faithful, the ridicule, 
There were some major highs. There were some pretty deep lows. But through it all, he stayed faithful to God. And it's easy for him to look around and say, I, I failed. I wasted my time. I should have just done something else. God, what was the reason for it all? But I will tell you that that pastor did not fail because that was my home church I grew up in. That was the church that my dad got right with God in. My dad met this pastor playing baseball at the local softball league. And my dad had been far away from God at this time. And this pastor befriended my dad, brought him to church. My dad got reinvigorated for God, got sold out for the Lord, became a deacon in the church, became the song director and the youth pastor. And then right before all this messy stuff took place, God called my family as missionaries to the Canadian Arctic. The church had called my dad several times to come back and take over the church, but that wasn't what God had him. And from there, I would see the burden for, for missions, and I saw the burden for Canada as we lived in the Arctic for several years. And from there, I went to Bible college down in Southern California, continued my, my burden for missions, and that's what brought me here today. I can look at Pastor Mike Johnson, uh, who is now still faithfully pastoring a church. He's gone through some health issues. But I could look at him and say he was not a failure. Because we're not the only family from that church that's still out serving God. There's a handful of others who are faithfully serving God in their, in their different churches. All because of one man's faithfulness. Through the highs and through the lows. I'm sure Philip had some lows. In fact, tradition says he was martyred for his faith. But you just never know who you might influence. So my challenge to you today is to stay faithful. But it starts with being a servant today. So how is your walk with God? Do you love God? Are you honest? And do you, are you filled with the Spirit? Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for watching the message today. We invite you to join us again every Sunday and Wednesday for more inspiring messages from God's Word.